Hello, family. Yes, 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 I'm back. And I'm back with some breaking news. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, it, well, you know, since the last few minutes ago that we talked. But I hope everybody's doing well and I hope everybody's staying safe. Now, let's get right into this because I, I do want to try to make this quick. I know I say that in, in every video and it ends up still being about an hour. But I want to try to make this one real quick. Um, based on an article from the New York Post um, that came out October the 6th. So, uh, 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 we evidently, we, we kind of missed this one a little bit, but then they, they, they're not uh, broadcasting it and really putting it out there. But based on this New York Post article, a second grand juror in the Breonna Taylor case has come forward and wants to speak out. That's the second grand juror in two weeks. Because yesterday just marked two weeks that... Daniel Cameron made his announcement. It was just last week that the first grand juror decided that they wanted to speak and filed a motion. Now you have a second grand juror and all of this is unheard of. All of this is unprecedented. It's unprecedented that, that, that grand jurors want to speak and, 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 and you know, it all and, and are filing motions and, and grand jurors are just coming right out and saying, Basically, that they didn't get the information. Well, that's what the first grand jury was saying was basically that there's certain information that they didn't get and they just want the truth to come out, you know, and, and that the attorney general, Daniel Cameron, was trying to use the grand jury as a shield uh, to deflect and, and to keep uh, 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 folks from accepting account uh, accountability. So all of this is just uh, is, is just basically unheard of. But um, let me read some of this. I, I may not read all of it, but let me read some of this. A second grand juror in the Breonna Taylor case wants to go public about the secret proceedings that cleared cops of wrongdoing in the 26-year-old EMT's death. The unidentified juror has sought legal advice on how to speak out amid claims that Kentucky, uh, that Kentucky Attorney General Daniel Cameron misled the public when he announced he didn't mislead, he lied. See, that's how the that's how the news media tries to soften things and, 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 and you know, and tries to do their little soft cover ups is by using these little soft words. He didn't mislead anybody. He just strictly came out point blank and lied to the American public when he announced that the panel cleared three Louisville cops in, in Taylor in, in Taylor's March 13 police shooting death. And he had to, because of, of, of this first grand jury, he had to admit that he didn't even uh, 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 talk to, to the grand jury or even recommend anything about any homicide charges or anything like that. The revelation comes just eight days after another member of the grand jury filed a court motion asking for permission to go public. The grand jury indicted one of the cops well, we know they indicted uh, Brett Hankerson on wanton endangerment, but that was because he shot in the neighbor's apartment. Didn't have anything to do with Breonna Taylor. Cameron later conceded he did not request that the panel consider homicide charges in the case, prompting the backlash from the first juror. The full story and absolute truth of how this matter was handled from beginning to end is now an issue of great public interest and has become a large part of the discussion of public trust throughout the country. That's what the jurors, that first juror's attorney said. Cameron has until Wednesday to respond to the jurors' request to speak out, the Atlanta Journal Constitute said. Grand jury proceedings are secret, and in the case involving Taylor, the 12-member panel met in an undisclosed location for security reasons. But now, community activist Christopher 2X, head of the Louisville-based nonprofit group Game Changers, said he's been approached by a second member of the grand jury who also wants to go public, but is so far fearful about doing so. Glogauer, who is the, the, the attorney for the first juror, said this week he hoped his anonymous client's bravery has inspired the second juror to come forward. Our team will support them in any way possible, he told the outlet. Meanwhile, Christopher 2X said his group has met with the FBI and is pushing for a civil rights investigation into Taylor's death. I 
I feel there's no way in the last week and a few days that we can get a level of comfort and trust in this community until we can have real live individuals who studied this situation as it relates to their civic duty, he said, according to CNN. Okay, now that's the, the article that's in the New York Post. Okay, there was also an article in um, SpectrumNews1.com where they asked the question, um, members of the Breonna Taylor grand jury want to speak out, can they? Uh, and, and it goes on to say that for the second time in as many weeks, a grand juror who heard evidence in the Breonna Taylor investigation has expressed interest in speaking publicly about the proceedings. Two, uh, what, what you need to know. Two grand jurors have now expressed interest in speaking publicly. Uh, though proceedings are secret, a judge can rule to allow members of the grand jury to speak. In a court motion, one in a court, court in a court motion, one grand jury suggested that Attorney General Daniel Cameron is trying to deflect accountability and responsibility. One law expert said if he were the judge, he would allow the grand jury to speak. Uh, Cameron has faced criticism in the aftermath of the jury of the grand jury's decision to indict only one of the officers. Um, and we know what that what, what that is all about. His decision is not his decision to not recommend charges against the other two officers. Detective Miles Cosgrove and Sergeant Jonathan Mattingly has drawn world widespread condemnation from activists and attorneys for Taylor's family. But Cameron has said that his recommendation was only that a grand juror and grand jurors could have charged whomever they chose. Not if they weren't presented with that op with that option, not if they weren't presented with that option and not if they weren't presented with evidence that would support that option. Experts, however, say grand juries typically go where prosecutors lead them. And the grand juror who filed the court motion seeking permission to speak, the first one, has also taken issue with Cameron's characterization, saying in the motion that he is using the grand jury jurors as a shield to deflect accountability and responsibility. It, uh, uh, the, the statement goes on. The public interest spreads across the entire commonwealth. When the highest law enforcement official, and they're talking about Cameron, fails to answer questions, and instead refers to the grand jury making the decision. Now, the professor, the, the professional, the, the, the expert that they're talking about is a professor, a professor Ken Katkin of the Chase College of Law at Northern Kentucky University. And he's the one that said if he was a judge, he would let the, uh, uh, the jurors speak. Uh, Kat can use the same term, the public interest, when describing when a judge might allow a grand juror to speak out. The grand jurors should not say anything publicly about anything that happened in the grand jury unless they ask the judge for permission, he said. But the judge can give permission if the public interest favors it. The Supreme Court has identified four reasons grand jury proceedings should remain secret to encourage witnesses to speak freely, to protect witnesses from retribution, to prevent the person being ind indicted from fleeing, and to protect innocent people who may be grand jury targets but are never indicted. With the exception of protecting the confidentiality of some wit te witness testimony, Katkin said those reasons don't apply to the Taylor case. And the reason why they don't apply is because you don't have to worry about anybody that's being indicted fleeing because those three were indicted, uh, at least not uh, for anything serious. Um, and to protect innocent people who may be targets, of, uh, uh, but were never indicted. We don't have to worry about that either. Uh, we, in this case, we also don't have to worry about encouraging witnesses to speak freely because the witnesses already spoke freely. You understand what I'm saying? We don't even have to really too much worry about protecting the witness from retribution because, I, I mean, most of the, 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 the neighbors have already come out and publicly stated that they didn't hear the police announce themselves um, 
and, and, and told their stories. And a lot of them did it on air, uh, 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 you know, uh, and their names have already been put out there, just like this Sarpy dude, this Aaron Sarpy dude, who changed his story uh, at the at the last minute after two months. And, and after all that time of saying that he didn't hear anything, then after being interviewed and, and called up by the police over and over and over again, it, within that two month period, then two months later, he changed up his story and said they did announce themselves. So, so the grand jury talking about it is not going to protect his identity because we already know who he is. We already know exactly who he is. So none of those four main reasons why the Supreme Court said that these proceedings should remain secret, none of those four reasons apply to the Taylor case. So a judge should allow them to be able to speak. He added that if a grand juror felt they did not receive all available information to make their decision, they should be allowed to speak about it. I think it's very much in the public interest that they should speak out and say that the right information wasn't presented to them and they might have come down with a different judgment if it had been. Uh, regarding Cameron's recommendation to the grand jury, which were not included in the 15 hours of recording made public last Friday. Now, remember, uh, 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 um, Professor Black Truth told us about that. He told us that that's the reason why Cameron asked for more time talking about to, 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 to black out names and addresses and all that kind of stuff. He told us that the reason why they were asking for more time is because there were certain things that, that uh, especially when they were acting illegally, there were certain things that Cameron then wanted to remove. And him making the, the, the recommendation to the grand jury, that was not included in the 15 hours of recordings that were released Friday. Catlin said it should be released. I don't see a great reason that the prosecutor should be able to keep anything secret about what their recommendations were. The prosecutors are elected officials. They should be accountable to the public. See, that's the problem. The problem is uh, the American public is no longer holding these elected officials, these people that are supposed to be working for us. We are no longer uh, we are no longer holding them accountable for anything. We act like we work for them instead of the fact that we pay their salaries. We elect them. They wouldn't be in those positions if we didn't put them in those positions. It's not clear what the attorney general, general's response to the grand jury's motion will be. In a statement last week, Cameron said he has no concerns with grand jurors sharing their thoughts on our presentation because we are confident in the case we presented. But in a, in a hearing Monday, an attorney with Cameron's office told the court that the grand jury's request is effectively unprecedented and said that it would be extraordinary for the judge to address the matter merits of such a request absent the opportunity for the grant of uh, for the attorney general to respond okay now i want you to know that cameron has responded because he was given until yesterday wednesday he has now responded and he has now filed a motion to, 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 to get the judge to force the grand juror to keep silent. Now, he just said last week that he didn't mind the grand jurors uh, uh, speaking their minds and giving their thoughts and all of that as far as uh, uh, the case was concerned because he had confidence that they in the case that they have presented to the grand jury. Now that all these facts are coming out, now that the, the, the 15 hours of, of, of recording has been released, now that it has been proven that LMP, LMPD lied, just flat out lied 
on the affidavit to get the search warrant. Now that all that information is coming out, now all of a sudden Cameron is saying, no, 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 no. He's, 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 he's filed the motion to, to block the juror from being able to speak out publicly. So that's what that's what his latest move has been. His latest move has been to file a motion because the judge gave him because Monday uh, 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 this attorney in his office uh, speaks to the judge and says, you know, it wouldn't be fair or wouldn't be right or whatever it, it, for you to make this decision without giving the attorney general the opportunity to respond to the motion. OK, well, she gave him to Wednesday to respond. So Wednesday, he files a motion to block the juror. To, to keep the juror from being able to speak publicly. That's the first juror, the one that filed the motion. But remember, we got a second juror now that also wants to speak up, right? Okay, now, one more little piece of information that I want to give y'all, and that is this information about this search warrant. Now, we already know they lied on the search warrant because a while back, we already reported a while back that they had lied and that uh, the postmaster Gooding, G-O, I think it's G-O-O-D-N, yeah, the postmaster Gooding had just come on out and said that he had let them know that there were no suspicious packages being delivered to Brianna's house for Jamarcus Glover, right? Well, come to find out, um... And then I saw some dude last night talking about it uh, in the comment section. And he was talking about the police officers that actually were involved with the shooting had nothing to do with the obtaining of the search warrant. Wrong. They had everything to do with it. So let me read this brief article to you right quick. This was October by Jason Riley, October 7, 2020 uh, from, w, from WDRB.com. Brianna Taylor warrant was misleading, Louisville police investigators found. No, actually, even the judge said that she was concerned about the fact this Judge Shaw woman, the one who had approved, who approved the warrant in the first place, she comes back later on when she finds out all this information and says that she's concerned about the fact that this guy, Jans, lied on the affidavit to get the warrant but she wasn't going to do anything about it. She was going to defer to the FBI because supposedly the FBI is still supposed to be investigating all of this stuff. But the, the FBI investigation ain't got nothing to do with her. She's still the judge. She still has the jurisdiction. It's not like the FBI has told her to stand down or told her she can't make no decisions or whatever. See, that's, that's white supremacy closing in. Judges, prosecutors, police, all of them, all of them, lawyers in some cases, all of them tied up in it together. But anyway, let's read. And they have a picture up here of this jo Joshua Jans uh, uh, who lied on the uh, on the affidavit, who flat out, just flat out lied. Uh, a Louisville police detective accused of providing false information to get a search warrant for Breonna Taylor's home told investigators he didn't intentionally mislead a judge, but acknowledged he could have worded the affidavit differently. But an investigator with the police department's public uh, integrity unit, unit drew a different conclusion after interviewing the officer who applied, who applied for the search warrant, Detective Joshua Jan. Investigators believe the wording on the affidavit is misleading, Sergeant Jason Vance wrote in a summary of the investigation released Wednesday. Vance concluded that given Jans's statement, Jans is the one who, who, who did the affidavit for the warrant, uh, given Jans's statement related to the information, should be, given Jans, given Jans' statement related to the information, should be reviewed for criminal action. Now, that's what this Sergeant uh, Jason Vance of the PUI, PIU uh, uh, unit, this is what he concluded. That this man's actions, the actions he took with providing this false information on this affidavit to get this search warrant, 
should be reviewed for criminal action. Now, what we find out is Louisville police were repeatedly told there were no packages, suspicious or otherwise, delivered to Taylor's home in connection to a drug investigation centered around Jamarcus Glover, according to testimony in an internal LMPD report. But on March 12th, a day before the raid on Taylor Springfield Drive unit, a warrant affidavit written by James said he had verified through a postal inspector that Jamarcus Glover was receiving packages at Taylor's home. That was a lie. Because he never even talked to any postal uh, inspectors. He never talked to anybody at the post office, period. Not directly. What he did was, and it shows you here in the article, that actual uh, 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 part of the affidavit where he says that. In a May 19th interview with the department's PIU, PIU, a uh, public integrity unit and released to the public as part of the entire investigation into the Taylor shooting, Jane said he didn't contact the postal inspector, but instead asked Sergeant Jonathan Mattingly to check whether Glover was receiving mail at Taylor's home. Mattingly was the one that supposedly Kenneth Walker shot in the thigh. So Mattingly was all up in the business, all up in the mix as far as obtaining the search warrant. Now, James, James, uh, James claims that Mattingly told him in February that Glover was receiving Amazon or mail packages at Taylor's home, but nothing had been designated as suspicious by the postal inspector. That should have been it, right? James's interview shows that Mattingly never contacted the postal inspector directly. Instead, he submitted the request through the Shively Police Department which serves as a liaison between LMPD and the postal inspector because of bad blood between the two agencies. So the, the, the post office in, 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 uh, in Louisville won't even have any, won't have any contact, won't have any dealings or anything with the Louisville Metro Police Department because there's bad blood between them. Why is there bad blood between them? There's bad blood between them because of a story that I reported on uh, 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 back when this whole thing first broke loose, where Louisville police officers were working with this interdiction unit inside the post office, and they were actually opening packages and stealing stuff out of the packages. They were actually opening packages, seeing what was in the packages, and after opening the packages and finding out the information, then they would go and get the search warrant. Go get illegal search warrants. And remember, I reported on the one officer that had stole all those thousands of dollars for this package that was supposed to go to California. And when the package got to California, I think it was California. When the package got to California, they realized the money was missing. But remember, I told you in that report that the police officer had been so sloppy that he left his McDonald's receipt. He taped his McDonald's receipt back up in the box. So see, this is the reason why the post office in Louisville and, and, and the, well, I guess the postal system in Kentucky, period, won't have any kind of, uh, don't have any kind of working relationship, any kind of relationship at all with the LMPD. It's because of that crooked stuff they were doing. Opening packages, searching packages, and then using that information that they had gained illegally to go get illegal search warrants and stealing stuff out of the packages. So that's the reason why. That's the bad blood between them. That's the reason why Mattingly had to go through the Shively Police Department 
to get any information about packages being delivered to Brianna's home. And I'll have that, um, as a matter of fact, I'll have that video linked in the description box so you can go back and, and, and be refreshed about that story uh, of what was going on at the post office with the uh, LMPD and the post and the postal workers. Okay. In an interview with Louisville police investigators, Shively Police Sergeant Timothy Slack Sailor said he and Shively Detective Michael Kuzma got a text from Mattingly on June 17th asking they check with a postal inspector to see if packages were being sent to Taylor's home for Glover. Both Shively officers say the postal inspector told them there were no packages being sent to Taylor's home and that information was promptly and accurately relayed to LMPD. After Taylor's death, now this is after she has died, both, both Salia and Kuzma became concerned when they read the warrant affidavit written by James. Salia asked Mattingly about what James said, what James said in the, in the affidavit. So see, this person that was talking about uh, 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 the police officers involved in the shooting didn't have anything to do with the obtaining of the search warrant, didn't know what he was talking about, hadn't done his research. Because Mattingly was all up in this thing with this search warrant. He was all up in it. Sergeant Mattingly stated he told Detective James there was no package history at that address. No package history at that address. So now you got all of these different people telling this James guy, that there are no packages. There is no package history. No suspicious packages. None of that. But he still lies on this affidavit to get this search warrant. In his interview with the PIU, James emphasized that he did not write that Glover was receiving suspicious packages, but was making the point that Glover was receiving dot, 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 mail at that location, according to a summary. Was it, it the way you worded that specific bullet point in your affidavit? Was it your intent to mislead the, the reviewing judge? Jane was asked by the PIU in the interview. No, not at all. James answered, and like I said, I could have I I could have worded it a little bit differently in there. In a summary of the police investigation released Wednesday, Sergeant Vance pointed out inconsistency inconsistencies in what James told the police. Um, and this is the screenshot that it that it shows us. Sergeant Madeline reported back to James that Glover was not. And not is in is, is in capital letters, not receiving suspicious packages at the address. When questioned why James put on the affidavit Glover had been receiving parcels at that address, he stated he meant any parcels. Investigators learned throughout the investigation the inspector's office was only asked to check for parcels that were flagged as suspicious and not for any other type of parcel. So see, he lied right there. PIU investigators interviewed members of the Shively Police Department involved in confirming the postal inspector's information. Shively Police Sergeant Timothy Sellers and Detective Mike Kuzma confirmed they informed Sergeant Mattingly there had not been suspicious parcels delivered to the Springfield address. Investigators believe the wording on the affidavit is, is, is misleading. But given James's statement related to the information, should be reviewed for criminal action. When asked why he didn't reach out to the postal inspector's office himself, 
as was written in the, in the affidavit, because in the affidavit, he makes it sound like he was the one that had confirmed and verified that these, that she was actually receiving suspicious, suspicious packages at her home for Glover. That he was the one that had made contact. But when asked why he didn't reach out to the postal inspector's office, as was written in the affidavit, Jane said he asked Mattingly to do it because Mattingly had a good relationship with, uh, with postal inspector's office. But Vance noted that LMPD and the USPS inspector's office do not have a working relationship due to previous incidents. And after reaching out to Shively Police so they could contact the postal inspector, Mattingly was told by Sayer and Kuzma that there were no suspicious parcels delivered to Taylor's address according to interviews with the officers. In addition, Jane said he reached out to Sawyer about a month after Taylor's death to ask if Glover was receiving parcels at Taylor's home, according to a summary of his interview. He told investigators he asked Kuzma the same question, and the response I got was no, according to the summary. So even after, so a month after the after they done murdered this 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 young woman, he's still trying to get somebody to say that packages were being delivered, that suspicious packages or whatever were being delivered to J uh, Jamarcus Glover at Brianna's house, and he still could just like wine. Just like Thomas Wine, the county attorney. She was murdered in March. In July, he going to go to Jamarcus Glover and try to get Jamarcus Glover to come up after the fact and act like this girl was a part of some kind of big drug ring. And I done already put it out there. This big drug pen, this big king pen that's running all these drugs is supposed to be so dangerous, a $1,000 bond. Jamarcus Glover, a $1,000 bond. Come on now. Sawyer said in his interview with police that he told James there were no packages in months delivered to Taylor's address and the location was flagged if any were detected and the postal inspector would be notified, according to the summary. So they had flagged her address. So if any packages, any suspicious packages, anything that looked out of the ordinary, anything other than just regular mail or, or like they said, maybe something from Amazon or something like that. If anything else had showed up, it would have been flagged and they would have been notified. James also asked if Glover was receiving any mail matter. Sawyer said he would check. Sergeant Sawyer sick was confused as to why Detective James contacted him almost a month after the shooting incident inquiring about packages being delivered to the address, according to the summary. In his interview, Sawyer said it seemed odd. James texted him a month after the shooting. Now, this is what Sawyer told the investigators that he had told James. It looks like you're trying to cover your ass. Is what it appears to me. Sawyer told investigators according to audio of the interview. Jans claims that he was just trying to, you know, collect just this last minute uh, details and all that so he could uh, 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 finalize an investigative report about the raid. As for Jan saying he wasn't specifically referencing suspicious packages in the affidavit, Vance wrote in his conclusion that the, inspector, uh, the inspector's office was only asked to check for parcels that were flagged as suspicious and not for any other type. So that again is a lie. Now, this is something that Jan said and I want to read this to you. 
Ultimately, Jan said he felt confident in his suspicions that Glover was using Taylor's apartment in his drug trafficking business. This is Jan's speaking. They get other people involved. Who is they? Well, I'm going to tell you. He's going to tell you who they is. They get other people in, in, involved, and it's usually females, he said in his interview. It's usually baby mamas or one child in common or his girlfriends that they can trust. They can trust them with their money and their stuff. So when he came up with that baby mamas, he let you know exactly who he was referring to when he said they. They get other black people, other people involved. He was talking about black men. He was talking about black men that supposedly sell drugs. Like don't nobody else sell drugs in the world. Like white folks don't sell drugs. Like Asians don't sell drugs. Like, uh, like Latinos and Hispanics don't sell drugs. So that right there just lets you know exactly who he was talking about and that these folks uh, that, that, that Daniel Cameron said was supposed to be so interested in the drug ep epidemic, they ain't concentrating and ain't going after nobody as far as drugs is concerned but black folk. While Attorney General Cameron's office did not present evidence on possible false information in the search warrant, there is an ongoing federal investigation. Tony Gooden said uh, Louisville Metro Police did not use his office to verify Glover was receiving packages at Taylor's apartment. At the time, Gooden said a different law enforcement agency asked his office in January. He's talking about Shively to investigate whether Taylor's home was receiving any potentially suspicious mail. After looking into the, into, into the request, he said the local office concluded that it wasn't. There were no packages of interest going there, Gooden said. Last week, when asked if she was going to issue a show cause order as to why Jans shouldn't be held in contempt for, for, for providing false information in an affidavit, Judge Mary Shaw, who approved the search warrant in the first place, said she was concerned but deferring to the uh, FBI. Now, she actually said she was concerned that he had lied on the affidavit. That's what she actually said. WDRB didn't put that part in there, but that's what she was, that's what she actually said. She was concerned that he, that he may have lied on the uh, on the affidavit, but she was going to defer to the FBI investigation. And remember, Cameron said that that was the reason why he didn't say anything about the search warrant. He didn't bring up anything about the possible, about the false information. It ain't no possible false information. It's false information about the false information on the search warrant. It's because he too was supposed to be deferring to the federal government, in the, the FBI investigation. So now you got police officers just lying on search warrants, flat out line on search warrants, line on the postal service, line on the postmasters, and all of this after being told over and over and over and over and over again, not only by the postmaster, but also by other police officers in another police department that there was nothing suspicious going to this girl's house for this man. Flat out lied on the affidavit to get this search warrant. And it's because of that lie that Breonna Taylor is dead now. Had it not been for a lie, then there would not have been a search warrant. And had there not been a search warrant, then they would not have had no any business at her house. So it was this lie by Joshua James that got her killed. And when you do those, when you do those affidavits, that's a legal document. When you sign that thing, you sign that thing under threat of perjury. 
If it's found that you put any false information on there, that's perjury. Let me or you go somewhere and, 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 and do an affidavit so we can get something done with the court. And then the court find out later on that we provided false information. Our asses is going down for perjury. For perjury. Now, where is Thomas Wine? Uh, 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 you know, well, as a matter of fact, where are the Republicans? Where are the Republicans to demand, okay, uh, uh, Thomas Wine, what is you doing there? Mayor Fisher, what is you doing? You, you know, uh, 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 you know, Donald Trump can talk about these Democrat states being so weak and all of this kind of stuff, but he ain't saying nothing about all these police officers that's lying and, 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 and attorney generals flat out coming out and lying and all of that. So now do you understand the reason why these grand jurors are doing something that's unheard of, something that's unprecedented, something that's never been done before and, 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 and desperately wanting to speak out It's because all of these facts are coming out and they didn't hear any of this. They didn't get any of this information. They didn't get any information about this man lying on this to get this search warrant and lying on this affidavit. They didn't get any information about Mattingly being such a huge part of the obtaining of this search warrant. Now, he might have didn't sign the affidavit. He might have didn't write the affidavit, but he was a huge part of it. And the grand jurors are sitting back with probably minds blowed wondering what in the world because we didn't hear any of this information we didn't hear anything about a ballistics report being in uh, uh, uh not being able to confirm that 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 bullet that entered into madly actually came from kenneth walker's gun and that there's a possibility that it came from somewhere else So these grand jurors are, are, are hearing all of this evidence, all of this stuff for the first time. Some of them probably never heard that there were originally 12 witnesses that live right there in the unit. That lived in the apartment beside Brianna, on top of Brianna, on the other side of Brianna, right there in the same unit that she lived in. 12 witnesses that came out and said, no, they did not hear the police announce themselves. And then we find out that they offered 10 more witnesses on top of that who said the same thing. And these jurors are probably like, what? These jurors probably never knew that this Aaron Sarpy guy who claims after two months that he did hear something. These grand jurors probably never heard that he changed his story. That when he was first interviewed and first asked about this March 21st, right after the, 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 the murder was committed, he said, no, nobody said anything. Nobody identified themselves. The grand jurors probably did. And now all of a sudden they're hearing all of this stuff and they're realizing that they were used. They're realizing that they were used by the attorney general. They're realizing that his, that, that, that his plan all the time was never to indict, but he needed that grand jury to stand behind. And he needed the secrecy of that grand jury to stand behind. I hope all of them come forward. All of them come forward and demand that they be allowed to speak. And even if a judge says, no, you can't speak. They need to speak anyway. But I just wanted to bring y'all this information. Just wanted to let y'all know that, yes, a second juror has come forward and wants to speak out. Um, and that uh, 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 Daniel Cameron is a little shook because uh, last week he was saying, you know, it didn't bother him a bit. He didn't, you know, he didn't mind if the juror decided that, you know, they wanted that, that he or she 
the, the first juror that he or she wants to speak out and speak on their thoughts and all that because he was confident in his case. Now, all of a sudden, he's saying something different. Now, all of a sudden, he filing motions to block that juror from being allowed to speak publicly. But it was it's another one on his heels. And I hope that, that when you look around, it'll be two or three more on those heels. And now the proof is out there. The records are out there. The proof is out there that they flat out lied to get that search warrant. Ain't no misleading in it. Ain't no ifs, ands, or buts about it. They flat out lied. So I'll have these articles linked in the description box. So y'all can go and y'all can read them and, 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 you know, and maybe look, you know, maybe do a little of your own research and pull up some other articles and, you know, because maybe some other articles may be coming at it from a different perspective or whatever. But they're pretty much all, this, all saying the same thing. And, and you'll notice, especially with mainstream, the mainstream media outlets, you'll notice that they'll probably try to soften the blow, you know, and all that and, 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 and you know, and try to. Uh, 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 try to make it sound a, a little bit better than it really is. Instead of saying they flat out lied, they'll use words like misled and, and, and shit like that. No, you lied. You lied. And if this judge know like I know, she would go ahead on and she wouldn't be a part of this because this Breonna Taylor case is not going to just go away. I said it in the last video. That's the reason why they're not reporting on it in mainstream media. That's the reason why they're not talking about it in mainstream media. Because they want it to go away. And they think if they stop talking about it, if they stop reporting on it, stop putting it out there, you know, that gradually folks will forget about it. Things will calm down and it'll just go away. So I wouldn't be surprised if in the next week or two, they don't do something else to use it as a distraction, to distract us, to get our minds off of this. But no, we're not finished. We're not, we're not, we haven't forgotten about this, just like we haven't forgotten about George Floyd, just like we haven't forgotten about uh, 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 um, uh, Ahmaud Arbery. We ain't forgot about nothing. And yes, uh, 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 Derek Chauvin is out on bail. One million dollars, Derek Chauvin is out on bail. And you know that he don't make that kind of money. So all of his white supremacist buddies and and, 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 and all of his buddies in the fraternal order of the police and all that done got together and they done cooked up enough for money. Well, they probably had it all the time. They were just trying to wait. You understand what I'm saying? For a little while until things calmed down a little bit. And they knew they was going to let him out anyway. So, yes, Derek Chauvin is out on bond. Derek Chauvin is out walking around somewhere. So now don't be surprised if in the next week or two, they don't jump up and do something else, you know what I'm saying, to try to distract us from what's going on with Brianna and Daniel Cameron. But we ain't going to be distracted. We can, do, we can, we can chew gum and, and, and tie our shoes and walk at the same time. So if one of us don't, if, if all of us ain't talking about it, one or two or three of us will be talking about it. Somebody will be talking about it because we're not just going to let it go. Just like I said in the last video, mainstream media has said absolutely nothing about the black man that was shot at the Shell station in Louisville by the white uh, store employee. So they doing their best not to report on this stuff. But too many facts are coming out. Too many facts are coming out. And then you got Kendrick Wilson over there, you, you know what I'm saying, making all that noise. You understand? And, and folks can run around and talk about he crazy and talk about he just doing this for clout and talk about he ain't really got this and he ain't really got that. I can't see him putting himself in danger like that and putting his life in danger like that and he ain't got nothing. Because remember, long before Brianna was murdered, he had already started having run-ins with Hankinson. So he already knows about the LMPD. They running all up in his house and all up in his business and everything. 
So I don't think he would put himself in jeopardy like this if he had absolutely nothing. So we'll see. We'll see. But we're going to keep on reporting on it. We're going to keep on talking about it. We're going to keep on putting it out there. We're not going to stop talking about it. We're not going to stop talking about it. While we talk about other things. But I just wanted to bring y'all this breaking news and let y'all know that yes, a second juror has come forward. And that, that, that juror also wants the right, the privilege to be able to speak publicly about the grand jury proceedings. So, um, and Daniel Cameron is trying to stop it. He's trying to stop uh, these jurors from being able to come out and speak publicly. But he's the same one that, like I said, just last week was talking about, oh, no, he didn't have a problem with it because he had confidence in the case that they had presented. OK, well, he, he lost his confidence mighty quick. OK. But again, all this stuff will be linked, linked in the description box. The video that I did a while back talking about the relationship between the LMPD and the post and, and the Postal Service and the post office in Kentucky. Uh, that will be linked in the description box and you need to go and you need to look at that and then you'll understand the reason why they had to go through another police department to get any kind of information from the post office, from the postal inspector's office. It's because they had messed that relationship up so bad with all them crooked cops. And they were crooked cops in uh, 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 this, this special interdiction unit that they had or something like that back then uh, uh, and, and and probably most of the cops that was in that probably just ended up over here in this drugs narcotics union unit that uh, 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 Madden Lee and all of them were supposed to be in so make sure you watch that video and it'll give you the whole run and read those articles in that description box and it'll give you the whole rundown of why the relationship was so bad, but is so bad between the uh, the Louisville Metro um, Police Department and the post office. All right. And um, y'all just stay on code. Get this information. Share this information. Like this video. Get this information out there. Let folks know what's going on. Let folks know that a second juror has popped up and is ready to speak. And remind everybody that this big old kingpin with all of this elaborate uh, drug syndicate that he was running, uh, the biggest, probably the biggest thing in Kentucky, a thousand dollar bond. Y'all stay safe. Y'all be smart. Be ready so you don't have to get ready. And I'll talk to y'all soon. Good night.